Hi everyone, it's Conrad Fisher. Welcome back to Physiology. And what I hope you're going to do is take very seriously everything that we study. And by serious, I don't mean grim. I mean expect that you should have to read in advance, go through the slides, and read again. Now we're going to be adding some extra qualities to the slides so that we're not just reading the slides to you. You can read the slides to yourself. So we'll be doing some extras around the edges and adding in a little clinical things. And there is a lot of clinical material that can come out of fluid distribution in edema. The majority of our body's water is inside the cells or outside the cells. Well, it's inside the cells. The intracellular fluid volume is two-thirds of the total body water. Now, one-third of the total body water is outside. The interstitial fluid makes up about three-quarters of that extracellular fluid, and a quarter of the fluid is in the plasma volume. It's really tiny, isn't it? It's amazing how little of your body's fluid is actually plasma volume. It's tiny meaning that the entirety of your five liters of that plasma is really the tiniest amount. It's like a quarter of a third. Wow! The blood volume is the smallest part of us. This picture is a graphic representation of what I just said. It says the same thing twice. Two-thirds of our body water is intracellular. One-third is extracellular. Of the one-third that's extracellular, Three quarters is interstitial, and only a quarter of the extracellular fluid volume is in the vascular volume. So tiny, isn't it? Now, 60% of men is water, and 50% of women are water. That is because men have less fat and more muscle mass. But the greatest determinant of your body fluid compartments is your fat component. If you're 100 pounds, but 60% of you is fat, you have less water. The larger the fat, the less the water. The driest part of you is the fat. Did you know that fat has less water than bone? Bone has, has more water because there's blood vessels in it. Wow. Osmosis is the way that we move things between the compartments. In other words, you need a semi-permeable membrane. If it was fully permeable, there'd be no osmotic difference. A fully permeable membrane doesn't allow there to be an osmotic difference. How can there be something that is an osmotic gradient or difference or tone if everything is equal? At the same time, if it was completely impermeable, there'd be no draw because there'd be no chance of getting there. Water diffuses from a region of higher to lower water concentration because there's a semi-permeable membrane that allows it to go across. If it was completely permeable, there'd be no osmotic gradient. If it was impermeable, you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. You wouldn't feel it. It's so impermeable, nothing could get across. The greater the solute concentration, the lower the water concentration. Now, the osmotic properties don't spend a whole lot of time worrying too much about the difference between osmolarity and osmolality. Uh, we tend to use those terms interchangeable, because after all, a liter of water is the same thing as a kilogram per water, and that's why a liter of water, a kilogram of water is the same thing. One liter of water weighs a kilogram. One kilogram of water is a liter. We use the term interchangeably, and most of the faculty don't think it makes any difference at all. This is just to tell you, don't worry about the difference. They're used interchangeably, and it's okay. Well, your books will also have a picture of osmotic gradients, but the most important thing is for you to recognize that the red line in the center is semi-permeable. It's permeable enough for water to go across, but not so permeable that it lets the solutes go across. And that's why this is an example of a semi-permeable membrane that allows you to have an osmotic gradient, because it allows only some things to go across. And the reason that one channel is higher than the other is because that's a tonicity. It's a force. It's a power. That's an osmotic pressure or gradient. An effective osmol is a solute that doesn't cross the membrane. That's why it's effective. If it went across easily and was equal everywhere, it wouldn't be effective because everything would be equal. 
It has to be an unequal osmotic particle. Unequal. More on one side than the other. Like plasma proteins. They don't cross easily, do they? So they effectively serve to hold fluid in the vascular space. Albumin holds fluid in the vascular space. I have a patient right now. They, she needs a bad surgery. She needs big surgery, but she's very malnourished. The surgeons won't operate on her until her albumin goes higher. We have to feed her up, feed her up, feed her up, because we're afraid that all of her fluids will be lost from the vascular space. She'll have dangerous hypotension. So all of these things that we think of are miscellaneous facts for a step one exam are vitally important. And what happens in the mind of step one students is they start to say, nah, this ain't real. This is a bunch of crap for a test. It's not real, but it is real. Plasma protein levels have to be high enough to maintain blood pressure. Sodium doesn't penetrate as much as water. It will cross some capillary membranes, but it won't penetrate things like the cellular membrane. That's why sodium ends up being largely an extracellular particle, because it doesn't penetrate easily into the intracellular space. This is why if we have to do a lot of paracentesis on a patient who has a lot of ascites to remove, you can give them albumin in the vasculature, albumin in the blood vessel to keep the fluid in the blood vessels. This imaging helps you get used to the idea of how we assess and record and look at chemistry values. Looking at the sodium range, and normally 135, 136 to 145, uh, potassium. Remember, most potassium is intracellular. That's why the blood levels, do the blood levels are measuring the intracellular or the extracellular? Blood levels are measuring the extracellular. Blood levels are measuring the part that's in the plasma. So that's why the potassium is low and the sodium's high. Creatinine is at about a point, and BUN stands for blood urea nitrogen. Blood urea nitrogen. In the blood, where does most urea come from? It comes out of your biochemistry book. That's where it comes down. What do you do about a problem like urea? What do you do about a rising BUN? So the blood urea nitrogen, the urea, comes out of protein, protein metabolism, protein metabolism. Now, why is it that chloride is about 100? How come chloride doesn't have much effect on the resting membrane potential? Because the equilibrium potential for chloride is almost the same as the resting membrane potential. The equilibrium potential is almost the same as the resting membrane. That's why there's only one place in the body based on chloride, and it's the salivary gland. The salivary gland has a chloride pump. What is the major constituent of that serum bicarbonate there? Where does it come from? Bicarbonate is really based on carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is transported around the body as bicarbonate. So when you see the bicarb, it's really in proportion to the amount of carbon dioxide being transported around the body. Now, you will have to keep mindful of the units. You see, some are milliequivalents per liter, some are milligrams per liter, some are milligrams per deciliter. DL means deciliter, and a deciliter is one-tenth of a liter. One-tenth, of our, otherwise known as 100 milliliters. Well, why call it a deciliter? Why not just say, well, per milliliter? Because the numbers don't come out evenly. You see, if you did it in glucose, for instance, as milligram per milliliter, you'd have to call it 0. 0.6 to 1 milligram per milliliter. That's a very hard number to adjust to. So we tend to round it to per deciliter per 100 milliliters. An osmolar gap is important clinically when we think somebody has taken an overdose. So I uh, was in the intensive care unit this morning, and a person took an overdose of an unknown substance. And we figured that out because we measured her osmolality to be 400. But when we calculated it, it came out at only 300. And you know, what's the extra 100 in there? It's kind of like you're leaving the store, and you have a receipt for $20 worth of stuff. But we find $100 worth of stuff in your car. Well, you get the other $80 worth of stuff for, huh? So, remember, the largest component of the osmolality should be the sodium. Two times the sodium. Matter of fact, two times the sodium plus 10, because in the normal glucose, around 80 or 100. So, that only means four points from the glucose, three or four points for the glucose. And a normal BUN is only around 10 or 15. It's about three points for the urea. So, really, most osmolality is two times the sodium plus 10. 
That means the biggest component of extracellular fluid osmolality, and remember, don't get worried about osmolality, osmolarity, is sodium. So if you measure it and you find there's a lot more, it means there's an extra osmol in there. Methanol, ethanol, ethylene glycol. Methanol is a type of alcohol that's wood alcohol. Used to be used in that in the past for desperate alcoholics, drinking that stuff. Now, why bother? Just drink all the legal alcohol you want. We don't have methanol toxicity too much. Ethylene glycol comes out of antifreeze, a very important substance. It's a, ethylene glycol poisoning was what responsible for the creation of the Food and Drug Administration, poisoning children with renal failure and osmolar glops. Mannitol is used mostly therapeutically. There's no overdoses of that. But osmolar gap requires you to know just to calculate it. Yes, do you have to know to calculate it? Yes, you do. So we have to know that the body compartments in the extracellular fluid when there's a gain of body fluids, it enlarges that one first. Changes start in the extracellular fluid first. It starts actually in plasma first. Net gain enlarges it. Net decrease of body fluid decreases that compartment. And changes start first in the plasma. Changes start either up or down in the extracellular fluid volume. Symptoms tend to be intracellular, but changes are first in the extracellular. Looking at the concentration of the solutes are equal to body osmolality. And basically, things do come to steady state. Now, they may not have the same constituents. For instance, you have all of your chloride. Well, mostly that's equal. But you tend to have your sodium on the outside and your potassium on the inside. But the total number of particles is the same. In other words, outside the cell, sodium up, potassium low. Inside the cell, sodium low, potassium up. But the total number of osmolar particles has to be equal. Other than that, we wouldn't be able to live. Which particles? Different. Total number? The same. So the body partments in an intracellular fluid volume. Well, this varies with the effect of osmolality. Sure. Why? Because it moves things across, man. If I increase the effect of osmolality of the extracellular fluid, it'll dry out your cells. If I decrease the osmolality of the extracellular fluid, it'll swell your cells. So solutes and fluids enter and leave extracellular compartment first. And the intracellular volume is only altered if the extracellular osmolality changes. So intracellular is as an effect of the changes outside the cell. Changes start extra cellular. We put IV fluids into your vein. Into your vein is still extracellular, but the changes later are intracellular. So if we inject D5W or normal saline into your vein, that's an extracellular fluid change. So we have to know what swells and shrinks and shrinks and swells. Extracellular fluid osmolality increases, it tends to shrink the cells, dries them out, like putting salt on the outside of a fish. When extracellular fluid osmolality decreases, the cells swell. Another way of knowing is the top one says hypertonic, and the bottom one says hypotonic. Shrink, swell, shrink, swell. What a great picture. Great picture. Darrow Yannett diagrams is just the name applied to being able to understand the graphical form solute concentrations up and down, and fluid volume concentrations left and right. This is a standard way of just saying, well, look, intracellular fluid is two-thirds, and extracellular fluid is one-third. And saying, looking at the osmolality concentrations. It's the red line, the dotted red line, is at a high or low osmolar content. This red line is a low osmolar content. It is lower than normal, lower than the normal osmolality of 300, and just represents it in graphical form. And this diagram is the fluid volume increased, decreased, the same. The volume. The volume is decreased. Is the osmolality increased, decreased, or the same? The osmolality is the same. This is a loss of extracellular fluid volume. This would be like someone who's had big sweating or just had blood loss. This is blood loss. But it's saying, I can tell by just a glance 
that this is a decrease in extracellular fluid volume with the intracellular volume staying the same. Is there an osmotic difference in this diagram? Is there an osmotic difference? And the answer is yes. There is an osmotic difference here. The osmotic difference is that the osmolality goes up and the volumes of both compartments are down. Volumes are down. Extracellular on the right, intracellular on the left. This is a person who's just dry. This is a person living in a microwave oven. This is a net loss of water in both compartments. Both compartments. Just dry. And it is a person who's living in a microwave oven, just overheating. Is the osmolality up or down? The osmolality is up. And the reason it's up is also because they become equal after a while, don't they? Yes, both compartments do equalize. So this is a net gain of solute. The osmolality is up. And it's also taking water out of the intracellular space. People who get salt ingestion, people who take salt tablets over time, people who get mannitol, and basically dries out your intracellular fluid volume. This is a person who's a pickle. This is a person who's been pickled and their intracellular fluid volume is down. This is also why salt ingestion causes hypertension. You notice how the osmolality goes up, but also the volume goes up and outside the cell with the extra salt. And this is why high salt intake causes hypertension because it pulls fluid into the vascular component and raises blood pressure. That's why one of the reasons that we restrict salt in treating hypertension. The osmolality here in both compartments is down. You see how the osmolar changes always equalize? Osmolar changes always have to equalize. And this is a person who's got more volume in both compartments. There's a lot of water that's equalized. So if you drank a lot of water over time, it would equalize. And this is also why there's no edema in SIDH, because both compartments go up. When both compartments go up, you don't have edema. So there's a low osmolality of both compartments, like an SIDH. There's a low osmolality of both compartments, like a person who's just drinking a lot of water. This is a person who's drinking too much Gatorade. This is a person who has just isotonic fluid ingestion. This is a person who's gaining fluid like you drank a ton of saline, like you had a lot of Gatorade, and basically the osmolality stays equal. Isn't the osmolality equal? Yes, it is. Between the intracellular and extracellular fluid compartments, the osmolality is equal. But the volume on the extracellular component is up. The volume outside the cells is up because you're ingesting isotonic fluid. You can see how both compartments end up with an equal osmolarity because you have to become equal or you die. But this is an example of a person whose intracellular fluid volume is increased at the expense of their plasma volume. This is an intracellular fluid volume increase. So what's losing here is you're losing both salt and water. You're losing both salt and water of the extracellular volume. Salt and water, like in a person who's got Waterhouse Friedrich syndrome or Addison's disease, where you lose the adrenals on an autoimmune or infectious basis, and you lose both volume and you lose the salt because you don't have aldosterone. This slide is for you to be able to see a summary of everything we just said. So you should pause on this in order to allow yourself to compare between them. There is no net change in the difference between this slide and the previous slides. So if this slide were a darrow yana diagram, you would say that this is an increase in both the intracellular and extracellular volume and no change in osmolality, since this slide is identical to the previous ones. Well, how do we regulate volume? Aldosterone, one of my favorite hormones, increases sodium reabsorption of the principal cells. It's also where the potassium happens, isn't it? Principal potassium, potassium is principal. Principal potassium, potassium principal. So it increases sodium and excretes potassium at the principal cell. And the extracellular fluid volume gets maintained here. Not instantly, because aldosterone need time. Aldosterone need time. Principal cells absorb sodium and excrete potassium. 
and over a day they will maintain your volume. The number one thing that regulates aldosterone from where? The zona salterosa, the zona aldosterona, my aldosterona, and the zona glomerulosa. Life would be better if it would call the zona aldosterona. We'd at least know what we're all talking about. So the zona aldosterona, also known as zona glomerulosa, is under the control of angiotensin II. This is how angiotensin II maintains blood pressure. And high potassium makes it go up because high potassium increases the aldosterone in order to excrete potassium. In order to excrete the potassium. That makes sense, doesn't it? This slide describes volume regulation also by antidiuretic hormone. Now, what do you mean AVP? Assistant Vice President? No. Arginine vasopressin. So arginine vasopressin is the same as antidiuretic hormone. Arginine vasopressin. Well, what's the difference? Antidiuretic hormone is basically the volume change based on a 1% change in osmolality. It changes the volume. Okay, 1% change in osmolality increases ADH. Arginine vasopressin is the same substance at higher amount and makes you have a vasoconstriction. ADH makes you reabsorb water at the cells in the V2 receptors in the collecting duct and therefore maintains osmolality. V1 receptors is in arterioles causes vasoconstriction. V1 receptors in arterioles maintain vasoconstriction and maintains vascular tone. And the major regulators of ADH is a 1% change in osmolality detected in the hypothalamus or a 10% change in volume detected at your carotids. Volume at your carotids and osmolality at your hypothalamus. 1% change in osmolality, ADH. 10% change in volume, vasopressin. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is an indispensable, must know subject. The juxtaglomerular complex senses hypotension, it senses beta stimulation, and makes renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, regulates angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 in the lung. And the primary regulators, low perfusion of the kidney, senses it at juxtaglomerular cells. Beta 1, beta 1, beta 1, 1, 1, makes it go up. And also decrease sodium at the macula densa. See, if the macula densa picks up less sodium, it means it's going to make aldosterone eventually to absorb the sodium. Low sodium leads to sodium absorption. Low sodium leads to sodium absorption. High potassium hits the aldosterone, makes you excrete potassium. Low sodium makes you absorb sodium from the macula densa. High potassium makes you excrete potassium with the aldosterone. There's some negative feedback in regulation of this as well, where aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption and increases also the extracellular fluid volume. Yeah, and the renin is stimulated by the low blood pressure at that juxtacomerular complex. So aldosterone is one of the many regulatory mechanisms for low blood pressure, now, in the microcirculation, the fluid flux across the capillary is governed by a certain hydrostatic pressure, pressure of the fluid going across fluid flux. And the hydrostatic pressure makes you go across, makes you leave. That's your biggest mantra. Okay, so filtration is the same thing as hydrostatic pressure making pressure leave, making fluid leave a blood vessel. Oncotic pressure, largely provided by proteins, opposes filtration. Opposing filtration with oncotic pressure is the same thing as saying favoring reabsorption. Opposing filtration means favoring reabsorption. Opposing filtration means favoring reabsorption. So oncotic pressure opposes filtration, favors reabsorption. Filtration means leaving the plasma, going to the interstitium. What is your greatest factor favoring filtration? Hydrostatic pressure. Your mantra for today is Om Nama Hydrostatic Pressure. Om Nama Hydrostatic Pressure. What is the greatest stimulant to fluid leaving? Om Nama Hydrostatic Pressure is the greatest stimulant to fluid leaving. Absorption means going the other way. Opposing filtration is the same thing as saying favoring reabsorption. 
The greatest stimulant to filtration is hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. The greatest stimulant to reabsorption is the oncotic pressure in the capillary. The major force for filtration is the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. It's directly related to blood flow and venous pressure and blood volume. The more blood flow, the greater the pressure, the more there's hydrostatic pressure, the more it leaves. Oncotic pressure is, is the force that's in the interstitium. It pulls it out. However, oncotic pressure in the interstitium is just not as important as hydrostatic pressure in the capillary because there's just less of it. It's less of a number. Oncotic pressure in the interstitium pulls fluid out. Hydrostatic pressure in the capillary pushes it out. Hydrostatic pressure in the capillary pushes the fluid out. Oncotic pressure in the interstitium pulls it out. And it's from a small amount of protein that leaks. And you can understand that it is small because not only does a small amount leak, the lymphatics pick it up and remove it. So under most conditions, it's just not that big a deal. The major force for absorption or reabsorption is oncotic pressure in the plasma. Plasma proteins don't diffuse across. You see how this is a semi-permeable membrane? Semi-permeable is completely impermeable. None of these forces would have any effect at all if it was completely impermeable. Okay? No matter how cute you are, a blind person's not going to see you. So the thing is, if it was completely impermeable, you're not going to have any effect at all. Okay, so albumin is the most important plasma protein and the biggest contributor to this force. So the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitium is less important simply because it's smaller. Hydrostatic pressure in the interstitium opposes filtration, favors reabsorption. Opposes filtration is the same as saying favoring reabsorption. Opposing filtration is the same thing as favoring reabsorption. And hydrostatic pressure in the interstitium is generally close to zero. Now this Starling equation, different from the Frank Starling forces of the heart, summarizes everything we said. But let's say the only thing that's extra that's new there. You see, what's favoring filtration or favoring reabsorption is not new. The only thing that's new there is K. You see the K on the left-hand side? That's a diffusion coefficient. It's a feature of the tissues. Some tissues are just more permeable than others, like tissue paper is more permeable than a brick. So some tissues are just more permeable than others. And you can only change that if you somehow change the feature of the blood vessel. For instance, if you get burnt or inflamed, you end up having a greater coefficient of filtration because you've changed the blood vessel mechanics, the structure, the permeability of the tissue can change the permeability overall of fluids. That's a feature of the tissue. And minute to minute, that does not change. That K only changes under disease conditions. Lymphatics pick up the proteins in the interstitium. This is why the interstitial protein level is not a very important feature of the forces favoring or opposing filtration because interstitial lymphatics should get rid of all that protein. The lymphatic flow is directly proportional to interstitial fluid pressure, and it should pull it out based on what moves lymph. Motor pressure, muscle pressure, muscle contraction moves lymph. What moves lymph? What moves lymph? Muscle contraction moves lymph and protein out of the interstitial. Edema is accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space. Pitting edema is from vascular problems like congestive heart failure. Pitting edema can be fixed with diuretics. Pitting edema is from hydrostatic forces. Non-pitting edema is from inflammation. Non-pitting edema is from anatomy changes. Let's say a person has a axillary lymph node dissection for breast cancer. You can't diurese your way out of an anatomic problem. Pulmonary edema is like pitting edema of your lungs. The edema in the interstitium, you can't exchange gas if your alveoli are filled with dirt and goo and gunk. So this is edema of the interstitium of your lungs, so you get hypoxemic because you can't get gas across. Low hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries should provide protection for this because you should just drain the fluid out. 
Pulmonary edema is extra hydrostatic pressure in usually the left atrium from left ventricular failure. Left ventricular failure should have back pressure into the left atrium. The left atrium is back pressure into the lungs. We have no idea how delicate the tissues are of the lungs, like taking a piece of tissue paper and dividing it into 50 thinner slices. It's very easy to get gummed up with water so that there is no ability to pass gas across it. The elevated hydrostatic pressure in the capillary, the most common form of pulmonary edema is from this. You have increased left atrial pressure, which increases venous pressure, which increases pressure in the capillaries. Initially, an increased lymphatic flow will protect the lungs by reducing the interstitial proteins. But then it gets overwhelmed. The first sign of it is orthopnea, meaning when you lie flat, you get shorter breath, like pouring a glass of water in your lung when you lie flat. And you get a wedgie in a bad way. Elevated wedge pressure. Wedge pressure is left atrial pressure. That's bad. You measure left atrial pressure and wedge pressure on a catheter, swan gans catheter. This provides the confirmation that you've got bad pressure problems building up in your lungs. And the treatment is to reduce the left atrial pressure, mostly by, at first, diuresis, later by positive inotropes like dobutamine, amrinone, milrinone. Now, the other point about this is that you don't use a wedge pressure in a Swan-Gans catheter very often. But we have to understand it. Even if we don't use it much, we have to fully understand it, even if we don't actually use it. You have to understand the swans. This term ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sometimes some people call it adult respiratory distress syndrome to differentiate it from what happens in premature babies, but acute respiratory distress, ARDS means the lung she's sick and I don't know why. It means that I got a direct injury to the alveolar or capillary endothelium, alveolar or the alveolar capillaries, and it basically means that they're leaky. It's leaky in a wrong way. You see, one of the hardest things for people to remember on step one is that gases are supposed to diffuse, but fluids are permeable. Gases are supposed to diffuse, and fluids are permeable. So gases diffuse, fluids are permeable, and that means that you have abnormal permeability of liquid which fills up your alveoli and clogs them up and you can't breathe. And you get shorter breath, just as you would with pulmonary edema, and you get respiratory infiltrates, and you have a lung that looks like pulmonary edema, but all the pressures are normal. You have a lung that looks like pulmonary edema, but all the pressures are normal. And it can be caused by sepsis and bacterial pneumonia and trauma and gastric aspiration. And it's protein-containing fluid in the alveoli. It inactivates surfactant, and it causes reduced lung compliance. And the whole point is, it looks like pulmonary edema, but the wedge pressure is normal. It looks like pulmonary edema, but the wedge pressure is normal. So it looks like pulmonary edema, but it's not cardiogenic. And now for something completely different. Yes, boys and girls, you're going to have to learn to calculate. I'm sorry about that. I hate to bring bad calculations into good people's lives. But volume compartment calculations are a way of you being able to know how big is a fluid compartment. You might feel like, who cares? Why do I have to know? We have to know if you want to do dosing of antibiotics, for instance. If you want to be able to assess how big a compartment is, you have to say, well, I need to be able to know that this compartment is a certain volume, so I need to know how much of a drug to give. And basically, you give the certain amount of a tracer, and then you see what its concentration is. So I give you a gram of tracer, and then your concentration is a half a gram per liter. Well, you must have two liters. I give you a gram of tracer, and your concentration is 0.2 grams per liter. You must have five liters. I give you a gram of tracer, and your concentration is 0.1 gram per liter. You must have 10 liters. It's a way of assessing the volume of a compartment to dose antibiotics, dose medications. It's a way of assessing your total lung capacity. For instance, when you're having people inhale helium dilution or nitrogen washout to measure your total lung capacity. Now, tracers have to be introduced in the vascular compartment where they distribute and the capillary barriers and the cell membrane barriers. So if you want to say, I want to measure the plasma volume, 
So I give you a certain amount of tagged albumin and see how much it distributes. It's a plasma volume. Evans Blue tags the protein. I see the plasma volume. Well, I give you a certain amount of tracer and I want to measure the extracellular fluid volume. So I give you mannitol or a sulfated substance. That's the extracellular fluid volume. I want to measure the total body volume, total water volume, total body water, total body water. That's tritiated water. I give you a certain amount of tritiated water and see how it diffuses around. I want to measure the extracellular fluid volume. I give tagged sodium. Extracellular fluid volume. I give you mannitol. Just plasma volume. Evans Blue, tagged albumin. So knowing which tracer goes to which compartment is extremely important. Knowing which tracer, that albumin, is only in the plasma because it doesn't go anywhere, or that inulin, mannitol, sucrose, is only in the extracellular fluid volume because it doesn't go inside the cells, is a big deal. And total water, body water, like tritiated water or urea, which goes through the entire body volume. Now this is very important because, you see, if you subtract the plasma volume from the extracellular fluid volume, what do you get? If you subtract the plasma volume from the extracellular fluid volume, what do you get? The interstitial volume. Oh, really? 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 The interstitial volume. Really? So let's look at the blood volume versus the plasma volume. This is a very simple idea. It's when people calculate it becomes a pain, but when it's a simple idea, it just says, hey, listen, dude, you know, all of that is in blood is not plasma. You know, you got to remember to move, remove the cells. If you pull out the cells, that's the plasma. Yeah, I'm, I'm drinking soup. Yeah, I got to pull out the noodles, and that's the broth. So you take out the cells, and that's the plasma volume. Now, why that's important is that plasma filters the kidneys. Plasma goes across. Red cells don't. So plasma is only about half of blood volume. The higher the hematocrit, the less the plasma. The lower the hematocrit, the greater the plasma. So plasma volume and blood volume is not always the same because you have to remove the hematocrit to be able to say it's the plasma volume. What's the difference between plasma and serum, by the way? Hey, what's the difference between plasma and serum? Clotting factors. Plasma has clotting factors and serum doesn't. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our final slide in the fluid and volume section is basically saying, let's just summarize the volumes. The vascular compartment is the whole blood. The vascular compartment is plasma because it has a lot of proteins in it. And we use therapeutically something called dextran. Dextran is a sugar too big to get out of the plasma. It's a sugar too big to get out of blood vessels. Dextrans have been used from time to time, and people have hypotension when we want to raise blood pressure fast. We use them in trauma. We use them when somebody takes a gunshot wound, and we want to raise plasma volume very quickly. So dextrans is a sugar. It's benign, and it's too big to make it out of the vascular space. Extracellular fluid is salt and mannitol because it will go into the interstitial. It will go into the interstitial. And if you take the vascular component, and remove it from the extracellular fluid. What do you got left? Interstitial. Interstitial. Now, D5W, this is a very hard thing for people to understand. They don't understand that D5W means it goes just to water. D5W, 5% dextrose in water, essentially is free water. You can't just give free water to people because if you give free water, you're going to cause hemolysis. You're going to cause cells to lose. So you give D5W because what happens is that the sugar is metabolized and what's left behind is free water. So it, since it's free water, it goes through your total body water component. This is Conrad Fisher, and I approve this message. I send you a big hug.